Hey, we're going. Bloop boop boop. Bloop doop doop. Bloop doop doop doop. Hi everybody, I'm Michael. I'm Erica. And today we're gonna to talk about the two things that Mario was up to in 1992. So what do you think Mario was up to in 1992, Erica? I think he was up to making some changes. It was the start of something big that had a lot of growing to do. We should have looked this up. <laughs> vamp for a second, I'll look it up. Me? <laughs> yeah. I'm not good at vamp. vamp bah, 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 bah. <laughs> Even though it is a sequel, there is something exciting and new in this. So the story is very similar to a lot of other Mario games that are out there, but it's got a little bit more of a direction to it. There is a little bit of an interesting new story to this one. Mario comes home one day and finds out that he's locked out of his castle. Mm -hmm. And he needs to find these coins that serve as the keys to let him back in. Seems like a very elaborate security system, though, for Mario. We don't know until we get there who locked him out of his castle. So Mario in this game is the same Mario that we know, but I think it's a little interesting how in this game he is a little self-centered. One of the lands that Mario goes to is Mario Land, and it's like a big mech version of himself. Like, who built that? Did Mario have that commissioned? <laughs> but we also see that like he's got a different goal this time. He's not just trying to save the princess, and you know, and it's exhibiting self-care. He's <laughs> like, I want to go home. Let me into my house. But that leads us to who broke into his house and scattered his golden coins, and that's Wario. And it's not Bowser this time, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on Wario in general? He's very funny looking in this one, to the point of distraction. It is nice to have that different kind of character. Bowser is like the big brutish, sort of, you know, leading by strength kind of villain, and Wario's more cunning and hidden and in the shadows. Why these bad guys take valuable things and scatter them throughout a land of whatever you you never understand these motivations but i like that wario has a little bit more of an interesting motivation than just break down the castle door and steal the girl kind of thing the idea of wario being like the antithesis of mario i don't really think that's true because this game shows that mario himself can be a little selfish sometimes but that is sort of the entire point of wario he doesn't want to lead he doesn't want to rule he just wants to have all the things that's a fun character trait for him. I never think that Wario himself is completely evil. Whereas in most Mario games, the villain Bowser is evil. But then when we see, you know, they're still fine to go go-karting with him later. So maybe he's not that evil, actually. Well, and most villains don't think of themselves as villains. They just think of themselves as being right. Yeah. So Wario's just following his own needs in this way. And, you know, Mario, as we said, is kind of doing that too. So... Yeah. You know, it's not this altruistic thing where he's like, I gotta save the princess's life. He's He's got different motivations and, and so does Wario. What did you think about the graphics of this game? It was startling to me because we obviously played this on the Switch and it was startling to me how much it looked like a Game Boy screen. Like everything from the shape of it to the color scheme and everything else. And that this game was designed for that system specifically. You can tell that it was using the Game Boy to its full advantage, which makes it slightly clumsy on the TV and the Switch sometimes, but it's endearing and you get used to that. Even in the scheme of Game Boy games, it was an improvement. So we'll get to design in a second, but with the graphics, I think sometimes some of the design elements, there's too much going on for a Game Boy that gives it some slowdown. It's chugging a little bit. There's some times that your jump feels extra floaty, not because of the gameplay, but because there's too much going on. The tiny little device can't keep up with everything. So I think that the graphics don't necessarily hold up all the way in this game and it affects gameplay slightly, which is usually the thing that makes me not happy with graphics if they affect the gameplay. And so we started talking about design and we both agreed that this game is really interesting and fun. I like how the different lands that Mario goes to here are not the typical ones that we see in every other Mario game. I love the pumpkin land as, and as much as I was making fun of it, I love Mario land for just being so 
self-centered. Mm. <laughs> and then we can also just go into the character designs. So what do we think about how Mario looks in this game? It's one of those things you kind of have to get used to because honestly I saw it and looked at it as like, wait, is that really Mario? He's a little fuller and a little rounder looking in general in his body shape and you're like, wait, is that really him? Yeah, it is him. I liked his design overall, especially with the power-ups. I think it was really good to have some unique power-ups that enhanced his physicality and, and allowed him to stand out visually from other iterations of Mario. Yeah, it's interesting how for the power-ups in this game, they don't want to change the sprite too much because that would take up too much computational power, but you can't just change the color like getting the Fire Flower in Mario 1. He changes color and that's how you know he has it. You can't do that on the Game Boy. I think you're right about how the power-ups look. I like how Mario Land 2 uses essentially the Super Mario World sprite in the Game Boy form. It does have to make a few concessions to make it look right and fit, but he's taking up more of the screen in this game than he was in Mario Land 1, where he was tiny comparatively. And then we've got Wario in this game and he is a weirdo, and I kind of love it. He looks so goofy. As I said earlier, it's a little distracting how funny looking he is, but it's hard to kind of remember with the test of time if this was the first exposure you'd had to Wario in any of these games. Like, you wouldn't notice that it was kind of strange looking, but it was, it was a little cartoony even for me. I liked Wario's appearance overall for its uniqueness, but it was still kind of weird, which is part of the fun, I guess. What about the world map in this game? It's good. I like the layout of it. I like how there's little elements here and there that are kind of unique. You don't just walk over a bridge every time. Like there's the one where the turtle literally sticks his head out and grabs you and pulls you across the gorge. It's interesting to have those kinds of different elements on the map. I do wish you could see more of it at once, but with the limits of the Game Boy screen, they probably did the best they could in that regard, and it's not bad. It's it, I, I just would like to see a little bit more. I really do like the whole Polly Pocket kind of element of having like three or four boards within each one of those little worlds and, and have them be different and unique and have unique gameplay elements. Yeah, I really like the design of this world for all the things that you were saying, like the turtle or just the way that there are so many ways that parts of this world map are so charmingly connected to each other. I also like the design of each of these individual levels a lot too. I think they look fun. There's some more specifically Japanese theming in some of these levels that I think is really fun. I like the goo that you swim through, stuff like that. There's some good stuff in this game. And the monsters in this game. What do you think about them? Oh, they're fun. I think there's a good balance of flying creatures and swimming slash underground creatures as well as the ones that walk on land. There's a lot of variation in there. There's not a lot of variation of what they do or how you attack them, but they're interesting kind of little characters in their own right. If you look at them close enough, you're like, oh, each one of those kind of tells a story. We loved the shark. Mm -hmm. um, I loved all the bugs in the tree land. There's some really fun designs and they didn't have to use this many. This game could have survived just fine with only a few of these new ones, but there are so many new designs in yeah. this game. The guys with the little hockey mask and a sword stuck in it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of creepy, but it's cool. I it like it. It is cool. And they introduced that on the sort of pumpkin-y Halloween type board with the graveyard, which all of it was creepy. Like you, the first world is literally a, b a bunch of coffins sitting next to each other. And then you go into the graveyard and then you go to the witch's house. It's very well themed that way. And all of the design elements, including the villains are lending themselves to that. I like how this game has a mono theme, and we talked about mono themes in our Super Mario World video, so check up in the corner for that if you wanted to click that. Basically, the idea of a mono theme is that it uses the same seed of a melody as the melody for all of the tracks, but the way it's orchestrated and accompanied by the other instruments and, you know, what instrument it's on changes to fit each different scenario. And I think that's a really interesting way to do this in a game. I gave it high scores in composition for that I don't think that the instrument recording quality is amazing. I mean, they're not real instruments. It's, it's all, you know, synthesized, but it's not too bad because it was doing what it could with the hardware of a Game Boy at the time. 
kind of like the way the first Mario game was instrumentated. <laughs> it's just not a word. They did what they could with the three sound channels they could put together. You heard certain sounds drop out because they needed to get something else in there on one of those three sound channels. And this is sort of the same. I don't know what the numbers are there, but the Game Boy would have been very simplistic in what sounds it could make. It only had that one speaker on the front panel. I think they did do a good job with what they had. And I also love, like you said, the theme and variations idea of the mono theme running throughout it, but they did give a lot of variety to that. I played this game from head to tail many times when I was younger and had a Game Boy back in the 90s, which was a long time ago now, but when we picked this up again earlier this year, instantly it took me back to all those sounds and I knew exactly where each piece was going and where what sounds were going to come and what things meant. So it does stick with you even if not on a conscious level. So what do you think about the sound effects? I enjoy them a lot. They're not quite as clean as some other games in the Mario franchise, but they're good and again, they're unique in their own right. This game was really very special on a lot of like sound quality levels, again, for what they could do with that system. So the movement in this game, sort of what we were talking about with the graphics, but also a little bit just in the gameplay itself. I don't really love how Mario feels. Mario has always been kind of floaty. Like I remember using my Game Genie on my NES and one of the codes for the first Mario game was stop on a dime so that Mario could just stop on a dime and not have to skid a little bit. There's a little bit of that built in to what my expectations are for a Mario game, but this one seems a little extreme to me. You know, his jump is so floaty compared to many other Mario games. So it's not my favorite movement of them. It's not horrible, but it's not my favorite. I see that, but I also see how this sort of style of movement was very much in line with everything the Game Boy was doing. It fit in so well into that world for me that it wasn't quite as jarring. That said, it's still very jarring to get it on a 2024 TV set with the big screen right in front of you. You have to get used to it. I guess that was a little quicker for me because we had a Nintendo in my house, but my Game Boy was, was mine. I was the only one that played it. So I spent a lot of time on it and I think it just got a little more deeply ingrained in me than some of the other systems, even the Nintendo, which I also played all the time. What about power-ups in this game. Awesome. I love the carrot making you into a bunny rabbit. The fire flower we've seen in many games. It's the most popular thing. I didn't know what that little thing was until you pointed out that it was a feather, but I loved all the power-ups in this one, and I love how you can get different amounts of free lives and some of the hearts, things like that. Yeah, I do kind of miss having a spin attack with the power-up that lets you float or fly, but it's not that big of a miss because we don't really need it in this game like we do in in Mario 3 and Mario World. So mini games. So there are mini games in this game. If you are able to reach the second bell in a level, you've got two different mini games that you could potentially play. These are good because they're really short and they only give you benefits, but also you don't have to do them if you don't want to. If you don't really care, you can just skip the bell not take any of those special perks. You can skip that game entirely. That's a good way to do mini games. Camera learning curve difficulty bugs. So the camera sticks with you right through the game. The learning curve, there's some good conveyance. You do have to come up to speed kind of quickly in this game. It does ramp difficulty pretty quickly. There are no bugs in the game that I was able to find at least. But I do think the difficulty is just a smidge too high for a game that is so family friendly, like a mainline Mario game. I'm almost going to agree with you just because the difficulty on this for me doesn't feel like it gets incrementally harder with each one. It feels like it ramps up to a certain level of difficulty pretty quickly and then stays there for a lot of the boards, at least in the initial half of the game. And then the learning curve on this kind of matches with that, you know, once you get used to it. And it can be frustrating to have to go through all these boards to get quick at things, but you learn a lot of the skills you need in the first couple of boards, so I feel like that is on par. I'm just glad that it doesn't get like incrementally too much harder after you get to a certain difficulty point. We are going to ignore story and characters in this game because they really don't matter. It's just a sports game. 
What do you think of the graphics of this game? They were a really good starting off point for the Mario Kart series, which as we know went through massive improvements with every new iteration of the game. But the graphics for this one were, were still really good and advanced for where it was at in the time span of video game development. This is showing off the, oh, I, forget, I forgot which mode this is. I think it's mode seven. It's one of the cool things that a Super Nintendo can do that Nintendo couldn't. When we get to design, we can talk about the individual character designs. We, for the most part, gave all of these characters fives across the board, but there were some that we each didn't like as much. For instance, I only gave Mario a four out of five for this, just because this iteration of Mario, to make him fit in the cart, he seems to be a little stretched horizontally compared to most other versions of himself. I, on the other hand, was not terribly pleased with Donkey Kong Jr., which also I didn't realize it was Donkey Kong Jr. I was just like, that's just Donkey Kong and he looks weird. It really was just that he looked almost unrecognizable to me as anybody that I would know. What about track design? It was good and very frustrating. I do wish we'd seen more like we did in the time trial of like being able to actually see the whole map at any point. Not necessarily while you're driving like in the time trial because that would be dis distracting, but I liked how later games could have gave you an overview of what you were about to play in before you actually get into the race, and that, that would have been helpful. But the tracks themselves were laid out very well, if not very, very challengingly. I like the variety in this game, and when you already have Mario characters who are racing go-karts against each other, that's already weird, so you can be as weird as you want with this. You can have characters fall seemingly to their death, or fall in water, or fall in lava and be fine. I think it's delightful. The music in this game is really fun, and it's got so much character, and it's so delightful, I guess is a good word for it. The sound quality of this is still goofy, but this game's character is goofy in general, so I like that. This is another one I wouldn't say you have a hugely memorable soundtrack in terms of, you know, humming it to yourself while you're doing the dishes, but we all know this music very well. I imagine that when you're behind the wheel of a car, you probably could end up in your head once in a while. <laughs> I think a big part of why this game's soundtrack is not as memorable maybe is because there are a lot of things that are basically instruments soloing and like you're playing a blues lick here or there or a little jazz riff or something sound effects are not as strong in this because you're always hearing the burr of your little your cart's little motor and the squeaking of your tires when you turn so that kind of overpowers a lot i was noticing as we were playing just a minute ago that sometimes when i got a coin i heard the coin sound and sometimes i didn't because there was just so much going on. Not to the point of it being bad, but I wonder if this game could have been sort of rebalanced in its sound to make some things more important than others. I'm glad I didn't hear a sound every time you got a coin because it was a lot more than me. <laughs> How do you feel about the controls in this game? Very strong, very easy to kind of catch on to what was going on. There are some later versions of Mario Kart where there's a lot more buttons you have to hold or, or press or, or get used to using. I would imagine this is probably one of the easier ones to just pick up and play if you've never played before. I do kind of like how it's simpler and like there's not the drift boost in this game. There's no doing a trick over a jump to get a little bit of extra speed or something like that. I don't mind that in the, in the later Mario Kart games that do that but I like that this one's just very simple very flat because it sort of has to be for how 3d or some semblance of 3d works on the Super Nintendo I gave it a four out of five for both the controls and the weapons because I liked the later versions where you could do more but when you're doing less it, it is a little more user-friendly and it's a little more like down to like the core guts of what you're actually doing rather than you know any kind of flashiness what makes a racing game different from a kart racer is the the items that you get. I like that through each Mario Kart game, they play around with them. Some of the power-ups stick with you in every game. Some of them are only here in this game. Some come and go. The feather the, that yeah. lets you jump extra high doesn't exist in most of the Mario Kart games. I think I think it's in one other one, if I remember. You know, I like that they're like, what is another fun thing that we can do? Let's try this. And they just go with it. Learning Curve, it's very easy to figure out what you need to do. There are really only a couple things that you need to learn. Like, you really don't need to do the jumping with the shoulder buttons until you get to the special cup where you need to jump over a little bit of water or knock the gopher off your face. No, that's not, that's before the special cup. <laughs> <laughs> but go for Monty Mole, anyway. But <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a simple kind of learning curve to this, but then you do need to practice. I gave it a four out of five for difficulty because it's 
really hard <laughs> on some ways that are that is frustrating to me that but that doesn't diminish my enjoyment of playing it and i sort of forget that not everyone was like me my brother and i got this game fairly early after it came out so i probably had it in 92 or 93. it became my tradition that this was always the game that i played when school was delayed because of fog or ice or something, or when I had a snow day, that always made me want to play Mario Kart. Even to this day, whenever I wake up in the morning and I see snow on the ground, it's like, oh, I want to play Mario Kart. So any final thoughts on either of these two games, Mario in 1992? In terms of Mario Kart, we all have the perspective of time. This was not the first Mario Kart that I ever played, and I have played all of them and loved all of them. And I just keep looking at this one like this was the real solid start that this element of the Mario franchise needed. It wasn't my favorite because it doesn't have as much of that nostalgic sense for me, but it was so good and so needed that you can't call this a bad game on any level. You can't even call it an average game. This is a really good game and it was a good jumping off point for that. And then for Mario Land 2, it does have that nostalgia factor for me and I just love it to pieces. And I do love that Mario Land 2 gave us Wario and he has gone to do so much more in other games and other party games in his own games. Including Mario Kart. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for watching. What did you think of these two games? Did you have them on Game Boy or Super Nintendo? Or have you played the Nintendo Switch Online versions of the games? They're easily accessible there and they play great for the most part. So let us know what you think about them in the comments below. Give this video a like if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. To this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like. So check that out if you're interested. Up there is the button you can click to get to our channel and you'll see that we do reviews of video games and music and we just generally talk about media as well. Follow our channel if you're interested in that sort of stuff. We'd love to have you. And that's about it. Maintain your groovy selves. Bye.